We're going to peer into the structure of the four states of matter observable in everyday life, solid, liquid, gas, and plasma, which is the most abundant form of ordinary matter in the universe, seen in lightning, neon lights, and in the aurora around the sun in this shot of the moon I made in Casper, Wyoming during a recent eclipse. In addition to the photos from the book and the film, I'll be featuring images from my recent experiments with surreal multi-exposure photography. The past fall, I began using Photoshop tools to superimpose photos, starting with some fun sort of goofy scenes. In this shot of Venice, the ripples and reflection on the water make it look real. Lightning is a screaming hot plasma that cuts through the air. It aggressively jolts the air out of the way, triggering a massive thunderclap that propagates through the air molecules and vibrates our eardrums. Of course, we all know the glass is completely full of two different density fluids. Air is a low density fluid capable of exerting tremendous force. To trace air currents, I soaked wood chips in common chemical solutions and tossed them into my fireplace. The camera freezes the interplay in thin slices of time. Copper compounds emit blue-green vapors. Sulfur is blue. Calcium throws dense, solid-looking red, orange, and yellow waveforms, while strontium gives off the deep red seen in fireworks. This chemical vapor choreography will not last, and it will never repeat. By heating atoms, we can excite their electrons to higher energy. The electrons want to get back to where they were before all the excitement, and do so by throwing out the excess energy as photons of visible light. Color. When excited, every element gives off a unique spectrum of color as their electrons make the quantum leap back to their stable ground state. The green sheets and ribbons of Aurora Borealis come from atmospheric oxygen leaping back to normal after gaining energy from collisions with charged particles from the solar wind. My perception of color in works of art often transforms simply by learning about the piece. Color is precisely measurable, yet profoundly subjective. While discussing Vasily Kandinsky's composition, Red, Yellow, Blue, from 1925 at the Centre Pompidou, Paris in 1995, the colors changed right before my eyes. I followed his blue-red juxtaposition demands and added the fine lines of cranes in the Austin skyline. As a 19-year-old in the Merchant Marines on the USS Mobile Arctic, the biggest supertanker in the US fleet, taking on a full gale in the Atlantic Ocean changed my life. Storm seas must be hit head-on with the bow or ships roll and capsize. There are two other ways ships go down. We were continuously breaking waves with the bow and launching walls of water onto 100 mile per hour winds where they hit the wheelhouse on a fly 800 feet away. Storms have knocked the wheelhouse off many ships. Steel railing around the perimeter of the mobile Arctic was ripped away, as were the starboard lifeboats. The ocean raged in 80 foot swells of inverting peaks and troughs. Many tankers have broken apart under their own weight when the bow and stern were lifted up on ocean peaks with an 80-foot air gap underneath them. At night, thunderous jolts of deafening noise deepened my dread. I expected and accepted death and gained a sense of urgency about life. I adjusted the transparency of cellos to integrate them into the hillside and introduced depth by scale in this tranquil transition. Right at the interface between two different density fluids, air shapes the sea into long and short range order. Air pressures the water surface into long periodic rows, 
troughs and crests so precise, they look like tightly spaced streaks of light and shadow. The low density air hammers the high density sea into shape with the exactitude of old world craftsmanship. The sea is home to deep contemplation, eerily quiescent, foreboding, full of life and impersonal. A passive aggressor, slowly and steadily modifying coastlines worldwide. I wish it were otherwise, but she doesn't care. The wind picks on another dense fluid, that slow motion ocean of desert sand. Tremendous waves terminate at knife edge ridgelines along dramatic slopes. Silicon and oxygen are the most abundant elements in Earth's crust, and they have a slick little trick. They self-assemble three-dimensionally into quartz crystals, forming a six-sided prism with a six-sided pyramid at the tip. Hard-edged crystal grains flow and self-organize into ripples and dunes. Ripples don't blow across the surface of dunes. They arise from synchronized movements of individual grains into something greater than the sum of its many interacting parts, like the swoops and turns in a flock of starlings. Our stem cells choreograph the molecular self-organization of all our tissues and organs. There is no substitute for detaching from the man-made world to realize we are evolving under the same physical guidelines that shape the planet. Patterns are common in nature, and they form in systems that get forced out of a relaxed state of equilibrium. Raised fractal branching patterns add to the surface the way water erosion subtracts. Fractals are physical features that repeat as we zoom in and out. Tiny branches form on larger branches that also form on larger branches, and so on. The most magnetic mineral on Earth, magnetite, adds distinction to ripples. This dark, dense iron oxide settles in troughs while lighter, clear quartz grains are lifted by the wind and accumulate in crests. The iron that oxidizes and turns Navajo sandstone rusty is also taken up in the foods we eat, forming the hemoglobin in our blood that carries oxygen from our lungs through dense fractal branching networks to service all our cells. I feel a strange mix of elation and uncertainty as I wonder about the meaning of my life. How can random particles suddenly self-assemble and begin interacting with the environment? Solitude fosters a measured pace. Are these chemical interactions beyond our control? Odd tranquility lulls into serene, meditative dwell time. All life is made of elements produced in stars and found on Earth. Areas of our brain related to motor function generally contain more iron. Magnetite, crystalline iron oxide, can be found in the hippocampus associated with information processing, learning, and memory. I'm an experimenter. Much of my career was spent making atomic structure measurements at the leading edge of the fast-paced semiconductor industry in Austin. I worked at Semitech, the consortium of the leading global semiconductor companies, a model of pre-competitive cooperation. We had a fab, but we didn't make devices. Member companies pooled their resources to develop materials and processes to meet the roadmap for continued scaling. A single microprocessor now includes more transistors than the total number of people on Earth. As devices got smaller, many materials reached their scaling limit by the late 90s, and new materials had to be designed and developed. I have measured nearly 80 of the 92 naturally occurring elements. 
devices are built on and into silicon crystal wafers, thin glass-like discs. Consider the transistor gate dielectric, a thin insulator made of silicon and oxygen, but not quite the same as the quartz crystal grains of sand. This non-crystalline amorphous silicon oxide has no unit cell and no long range order. When it was thinned down to two nanometers, about eight atoms thick, electrons began to migrate through it. The COVID-19 virus is 40 times larger. A stack of 50,000 of these insulator layers is the same thickness as a human hair. We investigated metal oxides, hafnium oxide and zirconium oxide as replacements for silicon oxide since they are five times better insulators, but they crystallized and electrons can migrate along crystal grain boundaries. So here we just locate where's the zirconium and hafnium transition metals in the periodic table. The lower images here, instead of using light as in a typical photograph, we use electrons that travel through the sample and project a focused and magnified atomic resolution picture to a photographic plate. Could we mix hafnium oxide with silicon oxide and keep it amorphous? No. The material segregated into crystalline grains of hafnium oxide embedded in amorphous silicon oxide. Hafnium oxide crystallized by two different mechanisms depending on the hafnium to silicon ratio. The upper images here I texturized. It's an electron diffraction measurement that gives us information about the crystal lattice constants and crystal defects and symmetries. Over the course of several years, we used a metal organic, a carbon-based process to deposit the hafnium and the zirconium oxides on silicon, which gave rise to my artistic series of organometallic works comprised of primitive and modern elements as 3D canvas art. And this propelled me into the world of sculpture, paying tribute to the earliest known stone carvers, the ancient Greek Cycladics. I carved three foot by three foot by eight foot, five ton limestone butter sticks into Cycladic heads now installed in the sculpture park on LBJ's former 140 acre ranch in Johnson City, about an hour west of Austin. Limestone accumulates on the seafloor at a rate of about a foot every 10,000 years. So my cycladic heads were about 80,000 years in the making. This is a grazing incident, small angle x-ray scatter. But what it shows is that there's a characteristic wavelength. There's a periodicity to the distribution of these isolated grains. And so I know of no other material in the literature that has this periodic columnar behavior. Lava flows often display hexagonal columnar jointing due to contraction during quick cooling. The North American and Eurasian tectonic plates are drifting away from each other, pulling Iceland apart at about the rate that our fingernails grow. New lava renders iron, silicon, oxygen, titanium, potassium, magnesium, aluminum, and of course, zirconium and hafnium, elements critical to life and prevalent in electronics devices. Icelanders embrace the columnar structure in architectural highlights, such as this cathedral and concert hall in Reykjavik. The concert hall is quite a unique experience with lines and angles of unit cells reflecting and overlapping. As vast glaciers melt, streams transport cinders and ash into ponds that ultimately penetrate a hole through the ice, forming countless spiky conical features when the ice is gone. In Egypt, there are many conical features of mysterious natural origin along the road from Aswan to Abu Simbel. This atomic force microscopy measurement of two magnifications gives us information about the material surface micro roughness. And my sample of partially etched tisilicide was awarded Miss November for a calendar of Vico vacuum in 2003. 
M. C. Escher's first paper, Regular Divisions of the Plane with Asymmetric Congruent Polygrons in, in 1941, detailed his mathematical approach to artwork. He studied color-based division and developed a system for categorizing combinations of shape, color, and symmetrical properties that later mathematicians termed crystallography. Renowned for his major contributions to our understanding of black holes and collaborations with Stephen Hawking, Roger Penrose is also known for illustrating the geometric packing of atoms in quasi-crystals, where atoms are ordered but not periodic. There's no translational symmetry. You can't slide this in any direction and have it realign with the original position. Quasi-crystals are made with two or more shapes that fit together like tiles that fill the space perfectly with no overlaps or gaps when laid out on a plane surface. Hafnium-based metallic glasses have also been verified as quasi-crystals. Penrose exchanged ideas and inspiration with Escher for many years. Penrose and his father, psychiatrist and mathematician Lionel Penrose, designed staircases that simultaneously looped up and down, inspiring Escher's well-known waterfall and ascending and descending works. Zirconium oxide is an incredibly tough and resilient component of grinding wheels, sandpaper, and other abrasives. In cubic crystal form, it is cut into gemstones to compete with diamonds. It's optically flawless and usually colorless. The silicon substrate was replaced by indium gallium arsenide, but still scavenged oxygen away from the zirconium oxide and added an unwanted oxide layer between the substrate and the zirconium oxide. We scaled the zirconium oxide down to about six atoms thick and used small angle neutron scattering to look for events at very slight angles of diffraction. Only a few places in the world capable of making this measurement. We had high fives all around because we were finally able to circumvent crystallization. There are only a few places on Earth where a stream flows in rhythmic waves on sand. When a shallow stream flows across smooth, flat sand, several modes of volatility take center stage. Unlike patterns of ripples that decorate dunes, these features originate in chaos. The Medano Creek in Great Sand Dunes National Park may exhibit a smooth laminar flow that depends on the viscosity or density of the water to suppress instabilities. When a section of the stream warms up, becomes less dense, and begins to move faster than neighboring sections of the stream, turbulence kicks in. Pincushion features move in clusters with the stream. Changes in flow velocity launch interacting eddies and vortices. Sand and stream conspire to organize interactive networks of cells. When the width of the cells closely matches the depth of the stream, turbulence kicks in, causing high-frequency fringes within individual cells. Turbulence is the most extreme and the most common form of fluid flow. Leonardo had a lifelong fascination with water turbulence, which he compared to the flowing structure of spirals and swirls in human hair. Right at the interface between these different density fluids, sand may congregate into an incredible 3D still life, as if the vibrant stream suddenly stopped and solidified. Arctic midnight sun reflected between the ripples in this ice melt puddle, adding shadows to the cellos suspends them. Depth is also featured in partially reflecting water above the keys. Complex and chaotic, impulsively dynamic. This is how turbulence becomes a world-class sculptor of meticulous precision and borderless imagination. Nature exposes herself in alluring ways. Surface tension emerges when the stream stops and settles undisturbed into the sand with a brief sheen. Flowing water hones exquisite reliefs of ambiguous scale, like a virtuoso animator 
wandering through the Badlands. The physical resolution is limited by the grain size. Fine silt yields sharp lines and clean contours. The struggle for equality is fought in a density barrier tug of war at the stream-sand interface. Perseverance against tough odds is carved into the sand that stands its ground. Surface tension rises in the sand as a muted cry for justice. Self-organization and the laws that govern the fluid flow of air, water, and sand apply equally to plants and animals. An aspen leaf gets the iron needed to produce chlorophyll, highlighting a fractal branching network evolved to service the entire leaf. The natural flow of a stream sculpts countless variations of additive and subtractive plant-like patterns in sand. Efficiency sets boundary conditions for fluid flow. Fractal branching networks are streamlined. Nature is thrifty, a master of restrained innovation. She does more with less energy and avoids the needless. Life develops around fractal vascular networks established to efficiently transport nutrients and oxygen. Our lungs, blood vessels, circulatory, respiratory, neural, and renal systems are examples of fractal-like repetitive biological self-similarity where each tiny part is a replica of the whole. Form follows function. Dead or alive, fractals are frugal. Seeing is believing, or so we've been told. We expect the sun to be overhead, not shining up from below. So we perceive light as being on the top of convex objects that stick out and project their shadows downward. When the shadow is on top of a convex object, a concave, convex, optical illusion occurs. People with schizophrenia are not fooled by the illusion. Expectation does not overrule the implausible input from their eyes. Inverting an image of uneven topography may reveal overlooked structural details pertaining to depth. Painting irregular surface contours with colorful light also enhances unsung physical features. Our eyes send light and contrast signals to our visual cortex. The information is converted to electrical signals that travel through dense branching networks of neurons. This is how our cells communicate with each other and how we communicate with each other locally and globally. Our brain compares the image from our eyes with past experience to interpret what we see without having to think about it. This helps us quickly navigate the complexities of everyday life. Here's the crazy part. Our perception of structure is beyond our control. Even when we know what we are seeing is incorrect, we cannot overrule it and avoid the illusion. Who's in charge around here? Escher's investigations into impossible figures motivated the Penroses to publish Impossible Objects, a special type of visual illusion in the British Journal of Psycholo Psychology. Spurred by the article, Escher produced two prints of impossible buildings, which rekindled the interest of the true father of impossible figures, Oscar Rustevard, who painted optical illusions.
Saturated sand eventually dries and begins waltzing with the wind again in a perpetual cycle. Randomness and order mingle under a quiet, creeping shroud, calm and peaceful. Sheets harmoniously arise as air brushes sand into smoother shapes. Art doesn't pour out of the paintbrush onto the canvas when I sit in front of an easel. And it doesn't suddenly take shape when I put the hammer and chisel to a block of alabaster. Art is real and imaginary life experience rendered from abstract concepts into color and form. Art is a way of seeing and expressing Science is a way of understanding and explaining. Art and science share a broad platform of innovation that appreciates the beauty of simplicity. Both endeavors must push the envelope and contribute something new to be relevant. Sculptors and engineers may grapple with similar sets of problems Yet, defining a system typically excludes how we feel about it. Science is self-correcting, but has no rules for dealing with emotions. Logic tells us free will is an illusion, that our neurons abide by chemical reactions beyond our control. Emotion says otherwise. Curiosity gives rise to creativity. Art is personal, open to individual interpretation, in the eye of the beholder. That can't happen in science, the objective pursuit of truth. The streaks and smears at the interface between fluid granular materials constitutes another physical transition that may organize abruptly or as a seamless gradient. Nature does what's easy. As things change, there are many more ways to be disordered than ordered, so things tend toward disorder or increasing entropy. Entropy is a measure of randomness, how mixed up a system may be. It seems the Big Bang was a low entropy event, and entropy keeps increasing as the universe keeps expanding and cooling. That's why time is a one-way street. We can't go back and undo the past, but we are continuously finding new evidence of how we got here. We're not just made of the same stuff and form many of the same patterns found on Earth. All life can be traced back to Luca, a last universal common ancestor. Common to every living thing is a mechanism for copying a segment of DNA into RNA to synthesize proteins. We're related to everything that's alive. This is where it gets dark. <laughs> Humans are unique in the recognition of our own mortality. Life is a dynamic temporary process marked by aging and deterioration. Entropy casts a dark shadow in a minor key. More than 8 billion people will die in the next 100 years. Big Swede played the muted trumpet, spreading heartache throughout the South. His reputation as a swindler spread like wildfire by word of mouth. The Gomez gang jacked him up on Black Mesa with a hood pulled over his head. He was found by an Arizona backpacker, half buried in the riverbed. Mateo went there for a load of stone and saw it all from a ledge of granite. Down in an irrigation ditch, someone sacrificed red-eyed rabbits. The wind pushed the sleet around as the night shivered over toward winter. The church up on Old Pecos Trail was once again packed with sinners. A fly-by-night surgeon scrubbed his hands in the freezing rain at midnight. Shadows swept swiftly across adobe facades rendered by restless searchlights. A mountain man, strewn with tattoos, 
carved a grizzly out of soapstone as a bald cat stood at the edge of a ledge blasting taps on a tenor saxophone. The whole damn town's engulfed in prejudice flames kindled by hostility. No one complains anymore when it rains. They need to purge the property. Treasure maps turn up now and then and this eroding town begins to buzz. Dour resentment plagues this withering valley like nothing else ever does. Big Swede kept a hand-drawn map folded inside his black leather jacket. Tales of hidden treasure swirled as if Coronado just buried the hatchet. The police report found no foul play. Big Swede was considered unstable. The undertaker went overboard and set an old map face down on the table. Several odd symbols hastily penciled in threw the Uliberry brothers off base. Two more wretched stiffs got the short shrift with no way to plead their case. Land disputes and missing persons are part of life and death out there. Folks learn early to keep their mouths shut and to never count on prayer. It won't be easy getting back to normal after what's just taken place. Most folks lock their doors at night and leave the light on just in case. It was a pitch black night where the clouds obscured the stars, crutches, canes, and wheelchairs, scores of permanent scars. Alone with his thoughts, deep darkness sat beside him once again, permeating his mind like termites in teak and other bad omens. The night ran cold through his veins. It couldn't be suppressed the way a blind man can sometimes see much clearer than the rest. When he didn't say anything, it was his mind that kept talking and talking with a look of disdain and a pledge of revenge for all their damn mocking. He didn't lose his nerve when he lost his cool and his gaze went cold. He was crooked as a corkscrew, should have never been paroled. When a halo slips down a bit, it can feel just like a noose. A razor blade hooked on an old rusty wire had worked its way loose. He knew too much, but was way out of touch, this ex-prisoner of war who looked just like Sonny Stitt from across the sanatorium floor. Sunshine through Venetian blinds streamed onto the cellar door. As a kid, he scratched his name in wet concrete in front of the drugstore. Hopes and dreams had skinned their knees and were always on the mend. But just how heartless life became is tough to comprehend. Countless schemes had turned up lame throughout the dismal decades. Icy tears kept piling up like snowdrifts before the plow blades. The swing was empty, but still swayed rhythmically in the silent autumn breeze. Warm blood dripped steadily from the tattered edge of his fouled shirt sleeve. There were a bunch of swings and misses lately on the south side of town. Will he sink or swim, fighting for what he lost from the previous breakdown? Lying awake in the dark, over and over, placing side bets on a dead giveaway. The bleak horizon morphed into something eerie as he fired on birds of prey. He put a slug right through a Spanish choir boy for quoting the Old Testament. There was no one he could trust. Hope flickered like lighted candles during Lent. Heavy steam drifted silently upward from a manhole cover in cold blue light. Father Dolan swallowed his tongue and was covered in leaves amidst the blight. Ranchers rounded up optimism and branded it all with hot carbon steel. Skull tattoos again and again spread over wounds that will never heal. Water dripped slowly, heavily, agonizingly. His fed up mind ran on relentlessly, stoking deeply buried hostility. A man can reach the breaking point all at once and with little warning. No one in that disdainful town could have anticipated the events that morning. He had a focused gaze and was right at home with a wayward look on his face. 
there was something peculiar, particularly unsettling about this maniacal case. There were disturbing whispers about dementia, and please don't drink the water. Do you prefer a cop, a priest, a doctor for this haunting disorder? Wells went dry long before that daunting drought. Morality vanished. Suspicion sprawled out. Dreams were plagued by depression and despair. Ill will skulked like rust on an old Bel Air. The land cried out loud for much needed water amid scandal, betrayal, strife, and disorder. Churning winds kicked at the hillside all winter, exposing those guarantees never delivered. Ice-cold wind vibrated high-tension wires. Traditions and customs got hijacked by liars. Traditions and customs got hijacked by liars. Brightly painted shaman tried dancing for rain. Warriors and rustlers all suffered in pain. Splinters from handles of axes and pitchforks. Freight trains derailed, pulling cars full of corpses. Dead trees stood boldly on the side of a hill and morbidly admonished the mentally ill, swearing and cursing so loud for salvation, funeral service pending, petty litigation. Frozen tears gusted into silvery sculpted drifts where sadness kept working the graveyard shifts, where sadness kept working the graveyard shifts. The mesa was scorched like the earth just gave up. Crops were all poisoned with justice in cuffs. Smoke signals spewed out. There's no mercy rule like crossing the desert, a graveyard for fools. Figures were carved from chunks of red granite, evoking strange habits of worshiping magnets. He fled from the moonlight. He hid behind trees. He bushwhacked the hobos with Hansen's disease. A numbness engulfed us, for what could be worse? Beelzebub beckoned from inside a hearse. Beelzebub beckoned from inside a hearse. Now we're going to get back to, back to, back to the original business here. <laughs> Thank goodness. Graphene is the sexiest bit of organic material ever. A single layer of carbon atoms arranged like chicken wire in a hexagonal lattice nanostructure. It is extremely lightweight, elastic, and strong. The strongest material ever tested that distributes force from an impact. If you stack two layers of graphene on top of each other with a slight rotational misalignment, it shifts from being an insulator to a superconductor. Graphene has the lowest resistance to the flow of electrons at room temperature of any material. To study graphene, I put a postage, size, st uh, postage stamp sized piece of copper foil inside an oven and turned up the heat. I then turned on a vacuum pump to suck all the air out of the oven and introduced a little methane gas as a leak into the oven. The, it was so hot inside the oven that methane, CH4, the molecules jiggled vigorously and flew apart. The hydrogen got sucked into the vacuum pump and the carbon atoms drifted onto the hot copper and self-assembled into a pattern of repeating hexagons with a carbon atom at every vertex. I placed the sample in dilute nitric acid to dissolve the copper and the next day, I saw a faint shadow the size of a postage stamp suspended in the weak acid. The one atom thick sheet of carbon is visible to the naked eye because it still absorbs a few percent of red and green light. It's not 100% transparent. I carefully scooped up the graphene for measurements at the Canadian light source synchrotron in Saskatchewan. The red region is single layer graphene and the green is double layer. We published our experimental results in Nature Communications in 2013, which generated some fanfare. Highlighted in Scientific American, along with a spot on National Public Radio. The story was even picked up by Fox News Moscow. 
And of course, that's the liberal channel in Russia. <laughs> Perhaps the most spectacular example of how things change is triggered by freezing temperatures and emerges as an exquisite blend of art and engineering. Fractals form the backbones of frost crystals that sprawl out with awesome precision across my windshield in Tasuki. When water vapor condenses on a cold beer bottle in Austin, we get dew. Frost on my windshield is not frozen dew. It occurs when water vapor condenses directly into solid ice. Growth rates and morphologies have a strong dependence on temperature and humidity. Changes in the structure of frost indicate a change in the weather. Christmas tree and parabolic features grow rapidly while tropical leaves and feathers assemble slowly close to the freezing point. Bumps and scratches that stick out have a higher probability of attracting random water vapor molecules. The longer the branch, the faster it grows. Frost may be decorated with hexagonal ice ornaments that form like exclamation points at the end of many frost statements. No wonder we refer to the growth of crystals as though they are living organisms. Light gets bent traveling through ice, which magnifies the red hood of an old Subaru, adding color to pine tree fractals easily seen without magnification, another wonder of the natural world hidden in plain sight. The spontaneous formation of spectacular frost crystals seems to contradict our understanding of entropy in a world of increasing disorder. For the molecules involved, crystallization is low entropy, but the process of forming well-ordered structures like frost and stars and life gives off heat and light to the environment with a net increase in entropy. I try to capture this paradox of exquisite structure spontaneously emerging in a world of increasing randomness and disorder. We are an amazing collection of elements obeying the laws of nature, participating briefly in a process that has been going on without us for billions of years. There is no way to detach from the flow. Physically, we have so much in common with the world we inhabit. Perhaps finding kinship with fluid flow, self-assembly, and crystallization is a meaningful way to feel part of something grander than ourselves. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Very nice.